uh, good afternoon or good morning or wherever you are. I hope you're having a great day. Uh, my name is Alan Clegg. I am here to talk a little bit today about DNS uh, and the uh, DNS over TLS and DNS over, DO, uh, D over HTTP and uh, all of the related uh, issues and, and questions and concerns that we have uh, related to that. So, uh, um, so going to give you a little bit of an agenda uh, concept here about what it is that I'm going to be talking about. And uh, so this presentation is going to be a little bit different, I think. Well, it's already been different from probably most of the other uh, DOH or DOT talks that you've seen. It's going to be different in the fact that I'm not necessarily going to talk so much about the politics and the why we should be doing something one way or we should be doing something another way or why this is good or why this other thing is bad. Just going to be talking about the technologies and, and what we have available now. I'm actually going to be given a little bit of, a, of an example of a, a running configuration and showing you how I've actually been able to get this to work right now. So I'm going to talk about and differentiate the available technologies. I'm going to talk about DNS, DOT, and DOH and see what the difference is there going to uh, look at the uh, current environment. Where do we stand right now as far as the availability of, uh, of code, uh, the maturity of code, you know, where we are as far as testing goes, things along those lines. We're going to consider an actual implementation, and this is going to be a, uh, a small remote office uh, using DOH uh, to uh, circumvent uh, the visibility of, uh, of uh, uh, DNS uh, transactions to uh, upstream or through their uh, ISP and to upstream providers. I'm going to give you some thoughts on, on debugging and what I've had to go through and what I've had to deal with uh, over the last uh, last couple of weeks while, uh, while working on this. I'm going to look a little bit at future conversations. What are the things that we're going to be talking about in the future? What, what are some of these uh, the problems that we're going to run into with this? And then I'll give a couple of closing comments. So thank you very much for attending. And let's get into the meat of it. So I follow a number of people on uh, on Twitter, and you can find me at Alan at ISC. So it's at Alan at ISC. And these are some of the people that I've been following, and some of the questions and answers and and uh, contemplations that have come up um, while I've been uh, watching uh, other people's Twitter feeds. And uh, one of the things here, you know, the the right answer to uh, the uh, uh, the DNS question is that everyone should be running a feature complete caching and forwarding resolver on localhost. All of the rest of these discussions are noise from companies that want eyeballs. And that's a very interesting statement. And that's, it's a great idea for those of us that know what it means. The problem is that the target audience for DOH doesn't have any idea what those words actually mean. So what we're going to do is first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of those words and we're going to see how we go about implementing and how we go about defining what these terms actually mean. So what are we talking about? At this point, what we're talking about is the DNS today. And the DNS today we know runs over TCP and UDP port 53. We see it coming and going. It's not encrypted, so there's no uh, protection of, uh, of uh, the privacy or uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the visibility of the information inside the DNS queries and responses that are being made. It's very easily monitored. Anybody that is on the data path from you to wherever that packet is going, wherever the recursive server and, you know, uh, up between the recursive and the authoritatives, you're going to be uh, visible. It's easy to, uh, to monitor the information that's going through. It's very easy to block DNS uh, as we know it today. Uh, UDP port 53, TCP port 53, you just block uh, that port um, and you basically shut down uh, the ability to do DNS. It's very easily redirected. You know, the fact that uh, we are using UDP for a majority of the DNS transactions today means that it is you know, not really safe as far as uh, somebody in the in the line between uh, being able to uh, look at the information and change the information, um, either 
uh, you know, uh, just by uh, changing the packet in flight or by, you know, just, you know, aiming it at a server uh, to which it was not uh, uh, meant. And in addition, it is very easily modified. You know, there's no real uh, hardcore uh, uh, proof of the data going uh, across not having been modified unless you have DNSSEC implemented. If you have DNSSEC on top of uh, the standard DNS, then yes, your data is getting from one place to another, but it is still very easily monitored, very easily blocked, and you know, redirection is, is much less of a problem with DNSSEC uh, employed, but the uh, deployment of DNSSEC uh, on, a, on a whole is uh, less, than, uh, less than spectacular. So DOT is a DNS over TLS. So this is basically our good old DNS, but it is now encrypted using uh, the same encryption schemes as used on HTTPS. It is not mixed in with the HTTPS streams, but it runs on a separate port, TCP 853. So in this case, all of our data is now encrypted, so it's not visible to, you know, the, the person sitting on the wire or the, uh, the persons on intermediate machines. It is still easily monitored, but in this case, it is now monitored for the traffic, not for the actual content of the traffic. We know that DNS lookups are occurring over TLS, but we are not able to see the actual information inside the packet. This data or this, uh, this traffic is very easily blocked because again, we have a specific port number. We have port uh, 853. We're able to shut it down um, and, and watch where, you know, each of these, uh, each of these uh, queries is being sent and what the response is, where they're coming from. We are not able, however, to actually, again, look at the data inside. Very difficult to modify the information, again, because it is encrypted. We don't know what the data is, but we are adding a, a detriment because now we're seeing a more CPU intensive um, use uh, where we're being forced to do all of the encryption um, and we're having to do TLS setups and teardowns uh, for each server that's being contacted. Um, obviously, this is over TCP, so you can do uh, some pipelining, uh, but that's, you know, one of those things that uh, it's, it's, it's there and uh, hopefully it works well, uh, but there's a lot of tuning that we're going to be learning about uh, as far as the, uh, the higher use of TCP. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then we get to DOH, DNS over HTTPS. Now this is a, an interesting solution because not only does it encrypt the DNS packets, but it also encapsulates it into HTTPS, which makes it almost, in fact, it makes it invisible as far as being able to determine what the contents and the fact that it is actually a DNS query. It's now mixed in with normal HTTPS traffic, so it's not visible. You can't say, well, this, this client is doing DNS lookups because all you see is an HTTPS session and it may be DNS, it may be a web page, it may be remote procedure calls, it may be any of the other things that are currently being stuffed into HTTPS. It's very difficult to be redirected and it's very difficult to be modified because again, this is encrypted traffic with very, very strong encryption. So here is a, a matrix that uh, provides us with some information about how uh, the, uh, uh, each of the, uh, the, the pieces of this puzzle fit together. So uh, in the vertical, the first column we see, you know, can it be, and then each of the, uh, the items that I gave on the previous slides. And then for DO53, which is DNS over port 53, that's our, our existing DNS infrastructure, we say that obviously it can be read, but it, and it can be monitored, it can be blocked, it can be modified unless you're using DNSSEC and it can be redirected. And obviously you can follow through this slide, the slide, uh, the same as, uh, uh, it, it basically is giving the same information that was on the previous slides. So what does this look like? Um, as far as, as configuration, and, and from the end user perspective, what, what are we seeing? What, what do we as a network and system administrators, what should we be expecting to see? Well, in the next couple of slides, what I'm gonna be showing is a, a, an office 
based on uh, a user or multiple users. Uh, we're going to have the ISPs DNS servers where normally, uh, you know, this would be where your uh, clients are going to go for their uh, to do their DNS lookups. Uh, we're going to have an alternative or cloud based DNS and this is going to be either something run by the corporation or something that is run by a third party, a trusted third party. Um, and you're going to want to be able to do your DNS to that uh, possibly to that server instead of your ISP. And as with most uh, organizations, there's going to be some kind of a firewall or a router in between the office user, the home or office user and the outside world. And we're also going to add in what I call the watcher. And the watcher is either a person that is um, supposed to be there. So maybe it is the uh, network administrator, the system administrator that is, is watching, making sure that the traffic that's flowing back and forth is actually legitimate, making sure that, you know, any policies, uh, you know, no gambling during the workday, you know, no pornography, you know, whatever the, the, the requirements of the, the organization, making sure that those are enforced. And this watcher can also be someone that is not necessarily on the good side. This may be the bad guy or somebody that is trying to monetize the, uh, the DNS queries or the data, the, the traffic that's flowing between the office and the outside world. So based on those uh, people and pieces of equipment, let's look at each of the, uh, the, the types of DNS that we're talking about. The first of them being standard old DNS. Well, with standard old DNS, we're going to do a query and the red arrow says that this is a non encrypted DNS transaction. So this user does a transaction out to the uh, ISPs DNS servers. Um, and at this point, it is very easy to block that transaction or look at that transaction from the firewalls perspective. If in this case, you know, they, they're using a, a DNS provider or doing a DNS lookup that they're not necessarily supposed to do at the firewall, that traffic can be uh, inspected. It can be refused. It can be modified. It can be done whatever at that position by the administration. The watcher is able to sit anywhere on this red line and see the packets of data. And without QNAME minimization, without, you know, the, the, the shortening of the information, that can be all the way up to the root servers, anywhere from the uh, home or office user all the way up to the very top of the DNS tree. And this allows that person to look inside the packets and see the location from which the queries are being made. And on the return path, they're able to see the responses that are being given. So it's very very uh, interesting information, very monetizable information. So this shows that with standard DNS, it's easy to block and it's also very, very easy to watch. And this is good and bad. Um, good in the fact that it's very simple. We already have an existing DNS infrastructure that works very well. The problem that we have with this is the lack of uh, uh, you know, the lack of encryption, the fact that anybody along the line can see the information, the redirection, you know, obviously we do have some issues here. So let's look at DNS over TLS. DNS over TLS is going to now provide a, the home or office user with an encrypted uh, uh, transmission path to the ISP's DNS servers, assuming that the ISP is doing DNS over TLS. In this case, again, we're able to block the data at the firewall if it is to a server to which we do not expect DNS traffic to be sent. If we know that we are allowing them to talk to the ISP DNS server, we see the port 853 traffic, it goes from that home or office user to that server. We make the assumption that we trust the ISP and therefore all is good, but we are able to block any DNS that is being used to other servers other than the ones we have specified. The watcher, again, is able to see that there are DNS queries being made, but they have no idea what the, uh, what the internals of that are. They have no idea what is 
inside what the queries or what the responses are that are being provided to the home and office user. So we're, we're now safe from that watcher, but we do have some controls that are in place as far as being able to block at the firewall. Some policies are able to be put in place. Now we move on to DNS over HTTPS. Well, in this case, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sending traffic from our workstation at the home or office, and we're going to be sending it out possibly to an alternative or cloud-based DNS. Now, this could also be being sent to the ISP's DNS servers, assuming that they support DNS over HTTPS. And what you're going to see here is the fact that, again, it's going to blend in with all of the other HTTPS traffic. There's no way to be able to determine that this is actually a DNS query, that it is not, you know, that it's something that uh, might be, uh, you know, an application doing a DNS lookup. It might be the user, you know, using SSH out to something and doing a, a standard DNS lookup. You don't really know what the data inside that packet is. And so the firewall is at a complete loss as to being able to control this information. And the watcher is also at a complete loss. Now this works well as long as you know and trust the alternative cloud DNS server in this case, and that you're you know, willing to uh, uh, allow the communication there. The problem now is that a lot of uh, browsers and uh, we're uh, you know, seeing the ability of other applications and other malware and things to be able to do these lookups on their own. So while your operating system may be configured to use a specific server for DNS, whether it be you know, DOH or standard DNS, the applications are now able to make the determination of, hey, you know, I don't care what the uh, configuration is for the, uh, you know, the operating system. I don't care what the default is because I know what I trust as far as the application goes and it's going to go out and do its own DNS all on its own. And so we look at all of the different applications and each of them can actually be doing their own DNS over HTTPS lookups and we're never going to be able to tell that those are occurring. Unless you own both ends of this connection where you are the, the uh, you know, you administer the, the home or office there and you own the server at the other end, you're not even going to be able to tell if the users are using your DNS servers to do queries. Uh, this is, is very uh, distressing. And what's even more distressing is the fact that malware is now going to be doing the same thing. So now there's a lot of, of, of fear that's being put into people uh, depending on, you know, Oh my gosh, you know, I can't believe we're allowing malware to go out and do, you know, this type of, of a lookup. If you've, if you've looked at malware, you know, the, the uh, command and control uh, structure of malware, very rarely does it depend on anything that's really a standard. Um, you know, we've seen malware uh, distributed that, you know, yeah, it does some DNS lookups, uh, but it can use, you know, hard-coded IP addresses, it can use, you know, lots of other mechanisms, uh, you know, looking at a specific web page for additional information that's not visible to the human. Uh, there's a lot of other ways to control malware. So yes, there is an issue here with uh, DNS over HTTPS, but it is not uh, the end of the world um, as some people have, uh, have, have tried to, uh, to play it, at least not from my perspective. Uh, one of the things that is completely lost here is the ability of the firewall uh, to implement any uh, policies. So the no gambling uh, during work hours um, has now uh, gone out the window because the gambling app is now doing HTDO, uh, DNS over HTTPS uh, to figure out where its servers are um, and all of the other uh, things that are that are blocked by uh, uh, that are blocked by uh, policies. Uh, using DNS, you know, those DNS firewalls. Um, with DOH, it makes things very, very difficult. So where are we now? Where do we stand in today's, uh, in today's field as far as uh, the availability and the deployment of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 
these, these encrypted mechanisms. Well, DNS over TLS, uh, there are implementations and deployments uh, that are out there now. Uh, there is client support in Android 9 and above. It's automatic that uh, if you connect or if your DNS is configured to a, uh, a standard DNS server that is also providing uh, uh, DOT support, it automatically falls back to DOT or actually upgrades to DOT. Um, from the server side, being able to provide DNS over TLS, uh, the configuration is, uh, as an Nginx stream is very, very simple. There is literally a page uh, that I've linked here and these slides will be available um, uh, a little bit uh, later. Um, that uh, this page literally gives you, uh, you know, 15 steps or 15, 15 little tiny modifications that you need to make. And most of those are, you know, like a block of, of, uh, of configuration in Nginx. Um, and in fact, when I say 15, I mean, it's like 15 lines, not 15 blocks. Uh, so it's very, very simple to set that up. If you already have an Nginx uh, configuration, you know, just basically setting it up as a, as a, a TLS wrapper. Um, and if you're using DNS dist, or if you're familiar with DNS dist, uh, the newest releases actually have DOT support. So if you don't want to run an additional, uh, you know, web server with all of the additional uh, pieces and bits that are there, uh, you can take a look at DNS dist, and I have a link to it later in the, uh, I have the, the uh, URL for it later in the, uh, the slides. So highly recommend that, that uh, you know, you, you configure uh, DOT, very, very simple to do, um, assuming that you're, you know, familiar with uh, these, these technologies. If you're not, you need to get there. Uh, DOH, uh, there is a list of known servers, and I'm not really sure how well this is being maintained because I think that there's a lot more of them and there's a lot more of them that are kind of uh, down in the weeds that are hidden uh, than are listed. So if you go out to the uh, the curl GitHub, there is a DNS over HTTPS uh, section and there is a, a block of publicly available servers. And the, the biggest problem here is that, you know, yes, it's great to have a list of servers, but anything can be a server and you can't just go around blocking port 443 uh, you know because whatever you block at 443 to get rid of doh you are actually blocking all of the content available on that server as well so and i'm not not saying at all that they're going to or this would be a good idea but just consider the impact if www.google.com responded to doh queries um, would it be within your uh, ability uh, as an organization to be able to block uh, port 443 to uh, www.google.com? You know, I, I think that that would be a, a really hard sell uh, for a, a large number of organizations, and yet it would be nearly impossible, in fact, it would be impossible without doing some uh, man in the middle type things to be able to block those DNS transactions. So here was a list of, of some of the, uh, the players that are providing uh, DOH services. Uh, Google Cloudflare, Quad9, uh, Clean Browsing, uh, PowerDNS, and, and a bunch of others. And of course, and all the others. So I personally run two uh, DOH and DOT servers uh, out there in the cloud. Uh, they are not visible, uh, but you know, information gets around. Uh, do you decide to block them? Do you basically block port 443, except, you know, do you whitelist port 443? That's not going to work very well either. It's definitely, definitely not going to scale. So with that said, okay, so yeah, DOH clients. Uh, this was something that, that is interesting. Um, you know, a lot of the, uh, the major uh, browsers, uh, you know, Firefox, Chrome, uh, Bromite, which is a, a spinoff of Chromium, um, have built in uh, DOH now. And each of them will be configured by the application, you know, either through the, uh, uh, the, the configuration that's, that's a customer, that's user visible, um, or possibly with a, uh, you know, something that, is, that comes pre-configured. Um, and again, this is where the politics of the, uh, you know, who do you trust, uh, how do you, do you make it opt-in? Do you make it opt-out? I 
and everybody else is arguing about that and and i'd i'd rather not argue about that so i'm just going to stand back and let that uh, let that fight happen somewhere else now one of the things here is that this is a browser and client list of of uh, support for http or uh, DO, uh, dns over https doh what i was looking for because in my particular uh, instance i am trying to uh, protect my home from my upstream provider, from my ISP. And so what I am needing to do is I would like to put in a DOH, uh, basically a client implementation, but that acts as a proxy so that I do regular DNS queries. All of my clients inside my, uh, my house do regular good old DNS queries, but then all of the traffic from my own DNS server to my own owned uh, DNS recursive server is all inside a uh, inside DOH. So what I discovered is that there are a couple of different ones out there. Uh, Cloudflare D is available uh, from developers.cloudflare.com. Um, I took a look at this and it, it works. Um, it does allow you to specify the endpoint. Uh, you know, you don't have to use the Cloudflare servers. But it's, uh, you know, I, I was looking at the binary and one of the problems that I had with it is that it does not allow you to, um, to really uh, differentiate between what is going to be uh, locally handled and what does not. And I'll show you a little bit about that uh, on a, a next couple of slides. Uh, the DNS crypt proxy uh, is, able, is available at uh, github.com uh, DNS crypt. It has a, uh, obviously it does DNS crypt, but it also does uh, DOH. So I uh, highly recommend that you, you know, take a look at that. But then the one that I actually ended up using because of its available, uh, because of its ability to be configured and be able to do exactly what I wanted to was by a user on GitHub called Star Brilliant. I have no idea who this person is and there's very little, uh, you know, I, didn't, I didn't do a whole lot of, uh, of uh, searching but the DNS over HTTPS um, implementation that is provided by Star Brilliant does some really, really nice things. It allows you to specify, you know, the availability of a bootstrap server. So when uh, I'm trying to figure out what my upstream uh, uh, server is, you know, who am I trying to contact over DOH, you know, the Cloudflare specifically says, you know, use IP addresses here because you know, you're not going to be able to bootstrap. You're not, you have a chicken and egg problem. You know, which one comes first? You can't do a lookup, so hard code your IP address here. Well, the Star Brilliant uh, actually allows you to use a specified DNS server for the bootstrap process. It also allows you to specify uh, certain uh, 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 zones that are going to be handled locally. So I wanted almost all of the traffic that I'm generating to go up to my DOH server, but I did have some local things that I wanted handled locally, like my NADder, like my local, uh, my, my local zone, things that I didn't necessarily need to go outside of the organization, outside of my house. And this, uh, the Star Brilliant code allowed, it, allowed me to configure that. And there was some really interesting news that uh, came up uh, mid last month. And that was that Microsoft has announced the addition of DOH to Windows at the operating system level, it would appear. And so they are looking at this and saying, hey, um, we're going to implement this and we're going to put it in the code and we're going to have it automatically upgrade. So if your user is using DNS um, over, you know, DO53, and we recognize that the server that they're talking to does DNS over HTTPS, then we're automatically going to upgrade them and it's going to be, you know, encrypted and safe and secure and all those other things. Now, this is really interesting because, you know, this is, this is a major operating system vendor saying, we're going to put this into the core of the OS and we're going to automatically do that upgrade. You know, it's going to be one of those things that, yes, there's a configuration knob somewhere, but they're going to automatically do the upgrade for those people that don't know all of the words 
that David was talking about in that very, the, the, you know, the third slide, you know, recursive server, local host, uh, encryption, blah, 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 all this stuff. And it's now going to be done in Windows completely automatically. So there is a URL down there at the bottom. And of course, this is going to be pushing um, ISPs to actually do their own uh, DNS over HTTPS uh, implementations because it's going to be a selling point. It's now going to be, well, er, you know, everybody's hearing about this DNS over HTTPS. Oh my gosh, it must be a wonderful thing. It must be great. So, hey, upstream ISP, are you doing this? Well, if you're not, then I'm going to start using, you know, somebody else's DNS server. <laughs> you know, using DOH to your own ISP is blocking out some people and it's getting rid of your control plane. But if you don't trust your upstream ISP, because that's the guy who may be monetizing your, uh, your traffic, doing DOH upstream to that uh, uh, organization is probably not going to help a lot with that demonetization of your, uh, of your data. So I, as I said, you know, I, I am actually using this from my home. Um, I am using, and in fact, I have on my, uh, on my Android phone, I'm also doing uh, DNS over HTTPS uh, using a, uh, a proxy configuration. And I've discovered some really interesting things um, in having done this. So I'd like to give, uh, show you, uh, you know, the, the different pieces and parts that I used, the things that I cobbled together to uh, actually make this work. And so branch office is actually my house. Um, and so at my house, I'm running uh, Star Brilliance High Performance DNS over HTTPS client and server as the client. So what's happening here is that this is running on the DNS server, the one that's handed out by my, uh, my, by my uh, DHCP server. It's listening on the Ethernet port 53. So it is just a good old DNS server. That's all that the clients know. They're just as happy to talk to it as to anything else. There are no protective ACLs on this interface, on this, on this listening port, because it's all internal. And if something wants to talk DNS, I want it to talk through this server. Now, the, uh, the uh, Star Brilliant code allows me to look at the uh, incoming query and see if it is an internal queue name. And again, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm doing things like my local in adder ARPA um, is handled by my own local server. Um, I'm doing, I have uh, a fake TLD that I use here at, at home, and uh, that TLD is handled in-house. So I want all of my DNS queries that are being used uh, there to be uh, funneled to the local host port 53. So it's my local DNS server is listening on local host instead of on the ethernet interface but both the proxy and the DNS server are running on the same host. Um, so any other query is being sent to HTTPS, doh.cleg.com slash DNS query slash or question mark and then whatever the query is. So a standard uh, DOH server. So at this point, all of my outbound traffic that is DNS related either, well, it's not external, it stays inside and is responded to by my own uh, machine, or it is handled over HTTPS to the do.cleg.com uh, server. Now, my upstream provider, would, if they started looking at, the, if they actually cared about me as much as I think they do, they might start looking at my traffic and say, gee, that's really weird. He's not doing any DNS lookups anymore. And I've been watching my outside traffic, and there are a few devices, specifically uh, Google Home devices, that are bypassing the DNS server provided by my DHCP server, and they're doing queries outbound. So there are still some port 53 queries leaking uh, out to the outside infrastructure, but really, you know, none, uh, uh, you know, 99% of all the queries are now DOH or internal. So internally, I'm running bind uh, 9.14.7. Uh, it's listening, again, on the loopback interface. It handles my private TLD. You know, obviously, my, my DHCP server is, you know, putting DNS names uh, to all of my devices here at home. So all of my machines are able to talk to each other using DNS names 
but not have to go outside uh, the, the, uh, the house. Um, and obviously the in or ARPA for my internal things and uh, you know, RFC 1918 space, I don't, I don't have any reason for that stuff to leak out. So that is all handled internally. Now I actually do have two cloud instances and uh, I did this because I wanted, I, I had two different implementations of the DOH server that I wanted to play with. One of them uh, is uh, Debian 9 running up on Linode, and it is, again, using Star Brilliance high performance DNS over HTTPS client and server, but in the server side. Um, on the, uh, uh, as far as bind goes up there, it's by uh, bind 915.6, the development branch, and I'm using Nginx as a reverse proxy. Uh, so bind is listening on all interfaces, IPv4 and v6. It's a recursive server on port 53 but I have it ACL'd off so that only local host and my second cloud instance can do queries against the DNS server on this, uh, on this uh, uh, machine. I do on this server blacklisting and uh, ad blocking uh, via custom scripts. So in this way, I'm able to do all of the, uh, you know, creation of the blocking lists um, outside of my house, so I don't have to do, I don't have to worry about zone transfers of, you know, all of uh, RPZ uh, blocking uh, things, don't have to worry about any of that inside the house, all of it is done out on the, uh, the cloud instances. Um, Nginx um, was already in, an existing install, there are other web pages that are being served by this server, and uh, what it does is there are two different things that it does. It has a stream that accepts DOT connections on port 853. And it also acts as a reverse proxy for any incoming query for HTTPS do.cleg.com slash DNS dash query. Actually, no, I take that back. This is a different machine that's not listed here. Uh, it looks for a, a the a DNS query a URL, and then it feeds those queries to HTTP localhost 8053. Now on 8053 is where the DOH server from Star Brilliant is listening. It accepts those queries, converts them back into the raw DNS query, passes them to localhost 53, where all of my firewalling and my, uh, my ad blocking and uh, other things are done. And then the information is passed back up to the DO server. It's passed back up to Nginx. It's sent back across the wire to my DOH client back at my house, and then it undoes everything and feeds the data back to the actual client. Lots and lots of, not necessarily moving pieces, but lots and lots of, uh, of network connections that we didn't have to do in the past. Now my Cloud2 instance is uh, a Linode uh, running Debian 10. It's running DNS dist uh, from Git because I needed the master branch to get all the really cool toys. Um, it's running by 914.8, so it's actually running uh, the, uh, the latest uh, released uh, stable version of Bind. And again, it is running an instance of Nginx. Um, Bind is listening on localhost port 5353. It is not visible to the outside world. Um, again, it's only on localhost and 5353. It is acting as a recursive server. DNS dist is configured to listen on DOT on 853 and DOH 443 by the very, uh, by, by the built-in uh, settings of, uh, of uh, DNS dist. There's no reason, and in fact, I said Nginx, this is not running in Nginx. There is only uh, DNS dist running and listening on these two ports. Um, the DNS dist automatically load balances queries to localhost 5353. So it's going to do queries locally if possible. And if not, it goes out to the cloud one server. So it, it fails over to the port 53 on the other server. Now this machine is out in the cloud. It's away from me as a person. It's somewhere that most people aren't aware that I have an instance. And therefore I'm really less concerned about whoever it is out there watching. Plus, it is in the midst of, of a bazillion other things that are doing DNS lookups. So it's not impacting me as much if, you know, if my queries are seen. So in this case, port 53 traffic and the recursive things that are being done by the localhost server really don't bother me very much. 
So all of this being said, and the fact that all of this is actually working and, and quite amazingly well, um, it, it's actually really, really snappy. Um, debugging is a nightmare. Um, there are some really good resources, and I would strongly recommend you take a look at this. There's uh, the getdnsapi.net uh, slash query. Uh, you can go out there and it allows you to do DNS queries over UDP, TCP, and TLS. And that's the most magical part, is that it allows you to do the uh, TLS queries. You can do them with OpenSSL uh, if you write a little wrapper script, which is another thing that I've done, but it allows you to do it from a third party uh, perspective. Um, and then uh, DCID uh, on GitHub has some really nice uh, little tools, which bizarrely are written in PHP, which I wouldn't consider to be awesome but uh, they work very well. So uh, I'd like to say thank you for those uh, pieces of code. And uh, they provide a DOH and DOT command line clients. So you're able to generate uh, these uh, DNS lookups with a, a simple, uh, a simple uh, command line. You can actually do DOH uh, using curl uh, and you can do DOT using OpenSSL. So yes, uh, the availability, the, the ability to do these is all out there. Um, it's just, you know, sometimes easier to have a piece of code that you just throw a couple of words at instead of having to figure out what that stupid URL is every time. So, <laughs> how do you debug it? Okay, that's great. You got some tools. Now I'm, I'm doing some queries and I'm seeing some weird things. Well, the weird things are visible when you turn up logging. And yeah, that's great. Yeah, your packet dumps obviously aren't going to show very much because, yeah, they're encrypted. That's the whole point of this. And now the issue comes up, well, all of my, my, my traffic is encrypted and I'm supposedly providing privacy to my clients, but now I'm looking at and storing a bunch of log messages. Well, in the early days of these deployments, that's actually going to be the case. And uh, I hope that everybody's... Uh, yeah, you know, the terms of service say that, uh, yeah, we're going to be keeping some logs while we try to debug what's going on. Uh, you probably don't want to put it in those words, but, uh, you know, uh, practical experience uh, says that you're going to need to keep some of this information. The software is very, very young. Uh, you'll notice that the DOH client, the same PID number, uh, two back-to-back -back log messages logged within the same second provide the same date and timestamp, but in different places in the log message. Um, being a person that likes to digest log files, this is really painful and ridiculous, and I really don't like it. So, you know, we're gonna be seeing a lot of changes, and I'm gonna actually make some recommendations to, uh, to the, the, uh, the owners of this code. Um, so, you know, the log messages with the same data in different columns is painful. And it's very young is a good thing because right now is the time that we are going to need to be able to make changes without breaking everybody. Uh, you know, I know that, that Bind in, uh, in, in you know, a couple of, couple of releases ago inserted a new uh, field into the query uh, log message. And you know, there are, you know, 15 years of, of uh, uh, applications out there that are expecting one format, and then to have that log message change uh, caused uh, quite a bit of, uh, of uh, confusion and, uh, and uh, hilarity. Um, everything in DOH and DOT is named exactly the same. Um, I have two different pieces of code on my machine named DOH client. One of them is the actual DOH client that is going to listen for DOH, you know, connectivity on port 53. And the other one is a DNS test application. So DOH client in the global scope is not what I wanted to do. And then when I ran the one that I was expecting to work, it uh, errored out with uh, something that went wrong in the Python, uh, in one of the Python libraries. So everything is named the same. Make absolutely sure that you're running the code that you think you're running. And don't be surprised when it just up and quits working. 
uh, you know, installing one piece of software over top of another um, causes, causes tragedy. <clears throat> You're going to need to learn um, OpenSSL. Um, so I created or I, I found out on the net, wonderful, wonderful thing that this internet is, this little script that I called GetChain. And what it does is it runs the OpenSSL uh, in the client mode, connects to the uh, port 853 of whatever server I give it, and then it looks for the certificate chain and using grep shows me two lines before and five lines after the certificate chain text. So in this case, what I can do is I can say get chain of dns.google. And if you're not familiar, dns.google is 8.8.8.8. So doing this, um, you know, it's, it's using the name. So you really, you can do a get chain of 8.8.8.8, but it's gonna complain uh, because the certificate doesn't match the name of the machine that you connected to. So these uh, certificates were issued to the common name of dns.google. So it works wonderfully to say get chain dns.google and it shows me all of the information about the certificate that is being used to prove that this uh, uh, is a valid certificate. You can use paid certificates uh, from a certificate authority. You can go out there and do that if you want. You can use free certificates from Let's Encrypt and that's what I did because I'm cheap. And I tried just for fun uh, to use a self-signed certificate and I guess you could probably make it work if you forced it hard enough. But if you've got Let's Encrypt up and running, uh, if you can do, you know, an Acme, uh, get, a, get a certificate, then all is well with the world. Um, and and just, just do that and everything just works. Uh, so everything that looks simple, unfortunately, isn't. Um, wrapping DNS uh, queries in TLS you know, from the command line, it's it's pretty awesome. But if you're trying to debug it, looking at the data on the wire uh, really stinks. Uh, generating a DNS query over HTTPS, again, you can do it with curl or with a command line uh, option uh, or a, a command line uh, application. But it's not something that, uh, you know, you're going to be able to do without a little bit of research to begin with. Knowing which client is talking to which server is horrific. And I say this because, as I mentioned earlier, I run a DOH client on my Android phone. And it's implemented as a, uh, uh, as a proxy, uh, as a VPN solution. And so it grabs all the traffic and sends off the DNS queries to my configured DOH server. Well, I had configured that application to talk directly to the DOH server out in the world uh, because I didn't, you know, I wanted to be protected the same way when I was wandering around town as I was at home. What, of course, I didn't think about was the fact that by doing that, I broke my NAT or ARPA and I broke anything that was in those uh, domains or in the zones that were handled locally. So anything that used my own private uh, TLD, the, my, my, my uh, TLD that I've created, doesn't work on my phone unless I remember to turn off the uh, uh, DOH uh, client. And remembering to do that is something that, that my mind just doesn't do automatically. So even within my own, you know, very simple configuration, I'm already seeing problems where one thing works and one thing doesn't based on you know, the client configuration, which I wasn't expecting. Uh, blocking methods differ, so your results are going to differ. So if one server or if one client is talking to, and in this case, doh.cleg.com is my DOH server, and then clean browsing is the, uh, the clean browsing, uh, you know, anti-porn, anti-other uh, things uh, services, and so if I look up allen.cleg.com against do.cleg.com, it comes back with an IP address and it does the same at the clean browsing. However, if I go out and I do a lookup of some bad site against my server, I get back an IP address because I don't do the same level of blocking that the clean browsing people do. If I do the same bad site with their server, I get back an NX domain. Now, on the other hand, clean browsing doesn't do as good, well, it doesn't do the same level of blocking of advertising as I do. 
And so 00author.com is in one of the feeds uh, as a, a bad, uh, you know, a bad host. And I, on my server, return address of 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 as the, uh, you know, response to a blocked domain. On the other hand, the clean browsing uh, response is the actual IP address of the uh, server uh, that 00author.com um, is, uh, is resolving to. 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 is not necessarily what your blocking server is going to provide. They may provide NX domain. They may provide 127.0.0.1. It really isn't a standard. So you have to be aware and each of your clients is going to have to deal with a diff possibly different type of response depending on which DOH server they're talking to. Applications on the same client may be talking to different servers with different policies. If I'm running Firefox and I'm running Chrome and all of my uh, command line applications are using my DOH uh, uh, client, then I may very well be talking to three different DOH servers upstream. Is that gonna be a problem? Absolutely it is. Is that gonna be nearly impossible to debug? Oh yeah, because from those uh, the clients, the web browsers, it isn't, uh, the, the traffic isn't visible between the, the, uh, uh, the browser and the recursive server. It's now from the application to whatever recursive server they're talking to, end end encrypted, and it's gonna be a royal pain. And something else to think about that I hadn't really thought about a whole lot, is that there are now more caches than there ever were. Uh, there are caches in the DOH and DOT code, in the recursive server and in the client as well. So now when you think you've cleared the cache at that one machine and you're wondering why the query isn't doing what it's doing or what you expect it to do, then you have a real, you know, a, a real problem because you don't know whether it's, you know, you're talking to the right machine, you don't know whether it's a cache issue, you really don't know. So one of the things that you're really going to need to worry about is you need to learn your data paths. Obviously, with the reverse proxies in place, with all of the other pieces in this puzzle, you no longer have a direct path from your client to the resolver to the authoritative server. It now goes through all of these other pieces and it vanishes. Where did the query go? Well, it went from port 53 or it went into port 53 here, but it popped out as a port 853 or possibly as a 443. And well, it went somewhere, but I don't know where. One of the things you absolutely have to do is keep your software up to date. This stuff is changing daily. Um, and a lot of it is not packaged yet. So you're running code that's out of Git. Uh, there is not an automatic update mechanism. So you have to do that yourself. And I'm now finding myself in dependency hell because every piece of code depends on three or four libraries and oh yeah, we found this really cool tool that does this thing that nobody else does. And so now you're ending up installing a bunch of different things on your servers where you're doing your, your development work that you didn't previously. So based on the data paths, I'm talking DNS 53 out to my firewall. I'm doing some local inspection and possibly some local redirection um, at that firewall. I'm possibly talking DOH or DOT uh, across to a server somewhere out in the world. That server is doing maybe some firewalling work and maybe blocking or maybe passing or maybe returning modified information. We're now doing DNS 53 recursion out to the authoritative servers and we have all of those return paths. So you thought DNS was um, interesting to debug before? Well, it's just gotten a lot more interesting and a lot harder to deal with based on the encryption and the number of different possible destinations that the information is going to. So some of the conversations that we're going to have, and I know that I'm, I'm running a little bit over, but I had 10 minutes that I didn't get at the beginning, so I'm gonna use those. Um, we saw this uh, question earlier, and some of the questions that are coming up, I struggle with this. What should they forward to? So, so David said that, that we needed to, you know, have these uh, caching and forwarding resolvers. Where do these things forward to? Um, you know, a single user, a resolver on your local host, unless you're doing a whole lot of DNS, it's really a horrible performer. 
So you need to be sharing your caches with other people, but where do you want that cache to be? You know, is it going to be up at your ISP? Are you going to start sharing the fact that you have a DOH server or DOT server out there in the world that, you know, you want to mix with other people's information? And the, the concepts of privacy, performance, and reliability, how do we get all of those things together in a way that it actually works well for everyone? Bert went on to say, we must do DNS over HTTPS. And this, this is what, what, other, what were, was being said. You know, the IETF and, and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the people that were, were uh, pushing for the privacy, you know, we must do DNS over HTTPS because DNS is unencrypted. We have to have this extra layer of protection. And so we now are seeing large providers, uh, Google and Cloudflare and, and others, providing these services and all of a sudden, the same people that said, well, we've got to do this DNS over HTTPS are suddenly standing up and going, eh, but wait a minute, that's not really what we meant. What we meant was, uh, well, we'll get back to you real quick. And uh, JP, you know, was, was interested in the fact that, uh, you know, DOH was supposed to, you know, be blocking out and, and keeping your information uh, uh, private from your spooky ISPs. Um, and now, we're seeing that, well, those very same ISPs that we don't necessarily love and trust are now going to be deploying their very own DOH solutions. And so we're getting right back into where we were. A few less eyeballs, but a whole lot less control. It's interesting stuff, and we're going to have some good conversations in the future. Um, Paul Ebersman said, uh, and, and, uh, and I agree with him wholeheartedly on this, he's encouraged that several very large consumer ISPs are already doing trials of DOT and DOH. Because this is all being done over TCP, we're now going to see what's going to happen when a lot of our DNS traffic moves from UDP over to TCP. What's the extra cost going to be in hardware and network support? Um, of course, DNSSEC validating uh, end user devices would be nice, but I don't actually see that ever happening. Um, and the, uh, the DOT and DOH is last mile. So we're talking about the thing between the customer and their recursive server, not between the recursive server and the authoritative server. How are we going to do authoritative DOT or authoritative DOH, God forbid, and do persistent, you know, are we going to do persistent connections, uh, multiple responses per query? What works? Uh, we really don't have enough research in place. And I know that some of you are probably saying, hey, but there was that, that uh, the report that came out three days ago from uh, a, a place in the UK. Yes, I've seen that report. I looked over it. My slides were already done, so I didn't get into it. There is, there are some information, there are some studies out there, there are going to need to be a lot more. Uh, we're going to need to figure out how uh, pipelining, TCP pipelining is going to work, what's going to work well for us um, in the long run to get, uh, you know, this to function the way we actually want it to function. So moving forward, we have the technology available to deploy, at least in some you know, some, some sample cases, uh, you know, we can, we can start doing some testing. The things we really don't know is will it scale? Um, is this going to completely explode when we have, you know, 100,000 customers all trying to use DOT or DOH? Is it supportable? The problem now is going to be, you know, you, you uh, always, everybody makes a joke about, did you turn it off and on again uh, to get your, your system working? Well, the problem is going to be that when you turn it off and on again, that web browser is still going to use that other DOH server and your operating system and uh, whatever is still going to use that, you know, the, the not the one that your browser is using. And can you imagine the calls to the help desk? Early, early, early in my career, I worked help desk. And I will tell you, I'm glad I aged out of that. Now, timeframes for support and bind. We finally get to something that is ISC specific. Support in bind is coming. We are uh, working on this first quarter of uh, next year. 
uh, we're going to have a, uh, a, a large set of documentation as to how it's actually going to be implemented. We're going to have those plans in place. And we are going to have a, uh, a, a client in the form of, and, and I'll, I'll use the terms dig and delve. I'm not sure it's actually going to be in, in that code base, but it is going to be a client that you're going to be, use, be able to use from the command line to do testing. Um, by the end of 2020, um, it will be in uh, the mainline code, at least DOH will be in the mainline code, and it will be backported uh, from um, 9.16 into uh, other branches as, uh, as we see feasible and uh, as, uh, as is possible. So I have the links here. I'm going to provide these. Uh, I provide these because the uh, slides are going to be available later. So uh, please feel free to uh, go out and check out these, uh, these pieces of code. They're, they're wonderful things. They work very well. Um, and this is me. Um, I am Alan Clegg, aclegg at isc.org or alan at isc on Twitter. Uh, you know, please Alan, like. there's one question from yes. one of the participants that has not yet been answered. It says, okay. usually companies do not allow direct outbound traffic on port 443. They use proxies. Does DOH work over a proxy? Yeah, it's going to work the same as any other uh, uh, any other uh, HTTPS connection. Um, so what I'm what I'm going to see there is the fact that those organizations ha are implementing some sort of man in the middle. Um, you know, either they're doing a certificate, uh, a, a wildcard certificate of some sort that's been in, installed in their browsers. That's going to work fine. Um, and yes, it's going to be it'll it'll be proxyable just like anything else, um, and it will be it'll break just like everything else uh, because I be yeah it'll be interesting to see uh, I can't wait so uh, please whoever that is please uh, do get back with us um, as you see that implemented and what you what you're actually seeing uh, in that okay I don't see any other questions coming in at the moment there was one question actually earlier that I don't think has been addressed it was did that kind of DNS setup create a visible delay when using the network does the encryption slash decryption slash jump from one service to another slow down DNS lookups well that's a really interesting question and and from my perspective as the end user no it did not and one of the things that it actually made faster was the fact that all of, and this is, this is really weird, the ability to split the DNS into the things that I deal with locally and the things that I deal with out in the cloud actually made my network snappier. Uh, the fact that I'm doing my ad blocking and all of the large, uh, you know, the large zone queries out there on bigger hardware, uh, you know, the, the biggest machine that I have here in, in my, uh, in, in my house is is really small. Um, I'll, I'll let you know that everything that I run, all of my computing power, um, except for my laptop, runs off of 12 volt uh, DC. So I'll, I'll leave that as a as a uh, as a question to everybody else. What actually am I doing? But the the fact that the the processing power for the RPZ um, and ad blocking, you know, ad blocking and uh, malware blocking and all that other stuff is done outside over a relatively flat, fast network just was spectacular. Um, it, it actually is much faster, as weird as that is. Now, okay, I don't yeah, see I'm any the only, let me, let me get, add one other thing there. I am the only user, so I am not fighting, you know, I'm, weird. I don't have a lot of DNS traffic, so I don't, you know, it, it's not, there's not much contention there. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for participating in our webinar this afternoon. We apologize again for the confusion at the beginning. Uh, you know, sometimes these things happen and we appreciate your patience. Um, the recording and the slides will be posted on our website and we will send all the people who registered a notification when they are live. So even, you know, if you know somebody who wanted to watch the, the webinar live and couldn't, we will send out a link to it when it is published on the web and everyone is welcome to go check it out there. Thank you again and have a wonderful afternoon. Yep. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much for putting up with me for another hour.